do lecture 30, and then we have a final exam. Right. But we'll have in uh, you know, on the t on the 29th lecture day, we'll have any talks that people want to give and the evaluations. I don't know if we're going to have any talks. You still running, I still have any energy to do that? I still like to do that. Um, you know, it may not be as, as detailed as I'm hoping because I am running out of time, but I'd like to do something for even a little extra credit, I guess, even. Okay. Your All right. Well, you should you should email me or something, you know, about what it's going to be. Okay. Okay. Do you want to do that? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that's only twelve days away. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Use a little extra credit, and it would just be good for me to start presenting some of that. I think it'd just be good for me as a. I thought I might mention um, a couple things that I didn't talk about last time when I was doing restart convergence, just so that you and and we convergence, um, or at least on the weak convergence, you should you should know that um, where'd it go? Where'd my weak convergence stuff go? Um, yeah. Weak convergence, you should know that uh, they, uh, the comments on weak convergence um, let's say if it's an example if E N N equals 1 to infinity is a, an orthonormal set in a Hilbert space. Then what you get is that um, En um, does not convert as a sequence. En does not converge to anything in the norm. En does not converge in the norm. Sense, uh, in particular, sense, uh, for example, en minus em, um, which is equal squared is equal to two for m not equal to n, so that you have that en is not Cauchy. So that's the e maybe an easiest way to see that you wouldn't have it converging to anything if it's not Cauchy. Okay, the sequence itself is not Cauchy. <coughs> Um, but so we have to do a little calculation here. Do the inner product of en minus em with itself. You use orthogonality between en and em, and you get one plus one equals two. Okay, for en, right? Maybe we're all that tired that maybe we don't know how to do that. But I'll, so if I did that, right, I would get uh, en en minus zero minus zero plus em em. Okay. Don't have to worry about complex conjugates even here. So you would get one plus one equals two. Okay. So it doesn't converge strongly to anything, but it does converge weakly to zero. But um, en converges weakly to zero. How does that happen? Well, um, What you do is you have that, um, what I have to check, check that f of en goes to zero for every f in the dual, h prime, but what is the dual? Indeed, check, check this. Uh, but what is the dual element in a Hilbert space? The dual element would be f of x is equal to x in product z for some, well, z naught, well, some z in h, by the brief representation of uh, linear functionals. So then I can say, what is f of en then? f of en then is simply en in a product with z. Now, does that go to zero? 
z is fixed n going to infinity well we know that the um, sum of the e n z squared in absolute the square absolute value is <coughs> less than or equal to the norm of z squared by Bessel's inequality. So that means that this series, infinite series, n goes from 1 to infinity, converges. Therefore, indeed, the nth term goes to 0. And that's what we needed to show. QED. <laughs> OK. So what's a little? Um, corollary of this is one version of the riemann lebesgue lemma. So if now particular take L2 0 1, so take H equals L2 of 0 2 pi, let's say. Okay. With uh, inner product uh, uh, x y equals integral 0 to 2 pi x of t Let's take the real one, x of t, y of t, dt. OK. Uh, we talked about this. Talked about it as a completion of a certain space, but uh, that's the Lebesgue integral in general. OK. We need the Lebesgue integral, but we have that thing. And then uh, what, what am I going to do then? If I take, now I take f, so now if I now take um, x, in L, well, let's take Z in L2, therefore. What I'm saying is, is and they have a complete orthonormal system involving the cosines and the sines. So what I get is that integral 0 to 2 pi Z of T times sine of NT DT goes to 0. As N goes to infinity. And also with a cosine here. Okay? That's sometimes called the riemann lebesgue lemma. There's other versions of the riemann lebesgue lemma. This is the baby version. Okay. There's one where you you do uh, you do instead of l two zero two pi, you do l two of the whole line minus infinity to infinity. And then of course you can't just assume that z is just an l two function. You will have to assume that z is l one. Um, but then you get the similar thing, okay? So this is a, an aspect of the weave convergence then. So this is the inner product of the sine with the z, right? Okay. So I just thought I'd mention that. It, you should just see it. <laughs> okay. And we'll go on. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think we've done that before. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. What I want to go on to now is the open mapping theorem. I'm not going to say much more about integration. Um, Last time was kind of uh, fast and sketchy um, about the integration. Uh, there was this one theorem. I think I went through. Uh, it was supposed to be an application of lemma 4.9-7. So uh, maybe I'll wait until you ask me some questions about the problem. <laughs> okay, to talk more about it. I think I gave you one problem on integration here. Um, so we um, gave Polya's convergence theorem for numerical integration, 4.11-3, and that was an application of a lemma from section 4.9, uh, characterizing um, weak star convergence. OK. So I think I'm just going to skip over that for now and go on to the open mapping theorem because of uh, the importance of the open mapping theorem. <coughs> so open mapping theorem, um, 
again, it's the, there are, the author points out in this chapter, you have the Hanbanach theorem, which is for norm spaces. Then you have the uniform boundary theorem, which is for complete space, or Banach space. Then you have the open mapping theorem, which is also for Banach space. And finally, the closed graph theorem, which is also for Banach space. So there's three of the four theorems. The last three are for Banach spaces, and the first one was for norm space. So the completeness is going to be used again. And again, that means we're going to use the fact that Cauchy sequences converge in the proof of the open mapping theorem. OK, so what is the open mapping theorem? Um, first, I need a definition. What does it mean for mapping to be open? Let x and y be metric spaces. Might as well give it a more general case. Then a mapping T from the metric space x to the metric space y is open if what? If for every uh, open set U in X, I'll call it U for open in X, um, we have that the image T of U, is that clear what that is? It equals the set of all T of X, X in U, is a subset of Y, is open in Y. <clears throat> now, can you think of a lot, can you think of a very simple example that's not open? Think of a very simple example. Let's take y equals x squared <laughs> from the line to the line. Okay, and take the interval minus one one open. Okay, so mappings. Uh, uh, let's take uh, u equals the open interval minus 1 to 1 and take t of x equals x squared. Okay, this is not a linear mapping. This is just any mapping. Then a, ma a, a mapping, this doesn't have anything to do with linearity at this point. t of x equals x squared, what happens to the, the, to the u? t of u is then equal to, let's see, uh, fold the interval, right? So it's going to get the half open, half closed interval 0 to 1. Okay, so that's not an open mapping. What's, a, what's the uh, definition of a continuous mapping? Does anybody know a characterization of continuous mapping in terms of open sets? Do you remember that from your Math 532 class or anything? In metric spaces? I think it's in chapter one. Let's see, continuous Mapping is in all the metric space stuff is in chapter one. Continuous mapping. Um, yes. 1.3 dash 4. No. 1.3 dash 4. Um, a mapping is continuous if and only if the inverse image of an open set is open in X. T is continuous. If the inverse image, T inverse of V, let's say, is open in X whenever V is open in Y. So we know that the inverse image of an open set is open, but we don't know the forward image of an open set is open. Okay. So a bounded linear fun uh, you know, if you had norm spaces, a bounded linear operator is continuous, so the, it'll have this inverse property. The inverse of an open is open. But the, uh, the possibility of the forward mapping being open really has to do with whether if there is an inverse operator, then it will also be continuous. Okay, in other words, whether the inverse operator, if it exists, will be continuous. Okay, so this open mapping really has more to do with the inverse being continuous, in some sense. Okay, 
So actually that's the second half of the open mapping theorem. So let's go ahead and, and state the open mapping theorem. Too. Long chapter. <laughs> okay. Um, let X and Y be Bonnach spaces. So I need both X and Y to be a Bonnach space in this case. And let T be a bond with your operator from X to Y. to Y okay so I'm going to make it on to then T is open okay so in particular then the uh, You know, whatever the Im the image of T is going to have to, is going to be a subspace. The whole point has got to be a, a closed subspace. It's got to be a bonic space itself. Okay. So, in some senses, the image has to be a bonic space. Well, the mapping. That's all. So, we really require. So now, that's the first statement. T is open. Also, then you have a little additional statement. If in addition T inverse exists, then T inverse is bounded as well. And this comes from this characterization of continuity here, this note from 1.3-4. So the additional statement simply comes from this, re this result. Because if T inverse exists, then saying the mapping is open is equivalent to saying that T inverse uh, is continuous, okay? T inverse inverse, okay? So I need to check that T is open means T of U. So I need to check that, what well, well, I need to check that T inverse is continuous. T inverse is continuous if T inverse inverse of U, okay, is open when U is open in X, okay? And so that's just T of U, all right? So that's when it, if T inverse exists. If and only if T is open. Okay, so that's the additional statement from this characterization. We'll also be able to prove the, the boundedness of T or the continuity of T inverse. T inverse is already a linear operator. We knew that from the chapter two, so it'll be bounded if and only if it's continuous. Uh, so we'll be able to show this, this continuity uh, directly from the, as a corollary of the proof once we get this open business, actually. So if you don't want to go through this 1.3-4. All right. So there's a statement open mapping theorem. How the heck are you going to prove that? Basically, by hook or by crook, you're going to take, if you have an open, uh, let's see, I think what we're going to do is, because when you have a linear operator, you can basically... Uh, translate and dilate all over the space. So that's what's going to be happening. <laughs> We're going to, it's going to be enough roughly to take the open uh, unit ball around the origin, okay? And say if I take the image of that, then it doesn't squash down. In other words, it, the image of the open unit ball contains a ball. That's all we're going to have to show because of all the translation and dilation we can do. You'll see that. 
So that's the main lemma. But TB is in the open mapping theorem, but T P as in 4.12-2. Okay. So it's onto, and you have Bonnock spaces. Then the image of, well, if I'm going to put this, I'm going to put B0. We're going to have a notation. Put B0 equal the ball centered at 0 with radius 1, the open ball. Then the image of T. Excuse me, the image TB0, okay, contains some ball in Y centered at zero and radius epsilon. Okay, I might as well I'm gonna have the ball centered at the origin also. Okay. You know the origin goes to the origin, okay? So now you basically want to say, well, when I make this set, somehow I can't cut the origin off. I guess it's, it's not, not only does it contain a ball, but it contains a ball in Y. This is the ball in Y. I'm not going to distinguish it by putting B sub Y, B sub X. You have to keep track of that a little bit. I'll put a star somewhere, <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's see if I can draw a picture for that. This, this, well, we're going to have a picture. Um, I'll draw a picture in a minute. Okay. So what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to define what we're going to have here is as follows. We're going to have, in general, we're going to put Bn equal to B0, 2 to the minus n. Okay. So proof. We're going to have some notation here. And so consistent with that notation, put let B1 equals B0, 1 half. Let that be in X, okay? First thing we're going to do, first step is step one, is show that um, if I take the, ma the ball of radius one half now and take the image and close it, okay, then that contains an open ball. You have to play around a little bit to get this result. The result of the lemma contains some open ball B star. Okay. In Y. Some open ball B star. Just some one. I just need to have something that's got a positive radius. <laughs> okay. And some center. So I'm not saying what the center is. So uh, B star, which I'll call um, B star, I'm going to call it uh, B star Y zero epsilon. Okay, and why? Okay. Let's see, how am I going to do that? So, let's have a picture. So, I know that T of B1 is going to have to have zero in it, because, okay, because <laughs> T maps zero to zero, okay? And then I'm just saying that um, that's going to have um, an open ball in it somewhere, okay? So there's some other ball, ball here, B star. Here's Y naught, and there's some radius epsilon, okay? Epsilon's the radius of that thing. Here's TB1 closure, okay? Okay, how am I going to do that? This proof is by method of successive approximations. <laughs> okay, so just may, remember that we have Bonnach spaces, so we have complete spaces. So what am I going to do? I'm going to apply the um, bare category theorem somehow. How am I going to do that? Well, because I know that T is onto, so I'm going to use the T is onto. Use the T is onto. And uh, n-linear 
and the bare category theorem as follows. What I know is that if I take the um, union of all the k of b0 radius k, then that's equal to x. Okay. So, which I can um, now, and then, so y is going to be the union of the t of the b0k. In other words, if I just take bigger and bigger balls, I get all of y eventually. Okay? I have to, uh, which is equal to um, let's see, how is that equal to? Um, well, actually, I think I put k over 2 or whatever here. Because he wants k over 2. So this is going to be the union of k. I can bring the k out because the ball is itself, the ball itself is k times the ball. What does that mean by k times the ball? B1. This is k times B1. I can, I'm going to be bringing uh, a ball. <laughs> I, I can multiply, uh, what do I mean by the k times a set? I multiply everything in the set by k. All right. So if I multiply everything in the ball of radius a half and center at the origin by k, I get a ball again centered at the origin, and now with radius k over two. Simply by definition of the ball, and the fact that we have a, a you know a norm, okay, which is a good scaling property. Norm has a good scaling property. So this is k times b1. Now k, t is linear, so I can bring the k outside there. So this is t of uh, b1. Okay. So in other words, if I take this t of b1 and multiply it by k, what do I mean by t of b1? Well, here, this was the closure of t of b1 here. But if I take t of b1 and multiply it by k, that means I just take every vector in t of b1 and multiply it by k. I get a bigger set. Okay. It'll just dilate. K is a, yeah, K is going to be, I'm sorry, K is equal to, K goes from 1 to infinity here. Okay? Just the integers, positive integers. Sorry about that. Um, so I can certainly write X as all that, and so I can write Y because T is on to. Okay? So every point in X will be eventually covered, so every point in Y will eventually be covered. I got this. So, and also, um, obviously now I can also write this as union, uh, the closure of TB1 times K. Because if I've got the whole set and I add some more points in the, to this union, I still can't get bigger than the whole set, but I'm still at least as big as the whole set. So I can, I already have the whole set without the closure sign, now I'm going to throw the closure sign in. Okay. Now, another thing is if I dilate a set and then close, that's the same thing as just dilating the closure. Okay. So this is equal to the union of K times TB1 closure. You have to just check it. So all I'm saying is if I, if, I take, if I take a set and I dilate it by K by multiplying every element in the set by K, so it's a set of KY, where Y is in the set. All right, now close that. Well... Then I'm talking about adding the limit points, all right? Well, that means that uh, KYN goes, you know, that you just have to track down what it means here. Um, you know, ZN goes to Z. If ZN is in uh, KTB1 bar, uh, excuse me, K, and then ZN goes to Z, okay, <clears throat> that means that uh, ZN is equal to K times YN, and ZN goes to Z if and only if, ZN goes to Z if and only if YN goes to Z over K, okay, that's kind of obvious, just by playing with the norm, okay. Yn is just Zn over k. Zn goes to z if and only if Zn over k goes to z if and only if Yn goes to y equals z over k. So what you're going to see is that um, 
that the closure of a dilated set is exactly the dilation of the closure of the original set. <clears throat> so we're skipping over just little details. Just because otherwise the proof becomes horrendously long. <laughs> okay. I saw in the book it was long. The proof is already long, but he's going to skip some of these little details. Okay? So you're playing with dilation and translation in a lot in this proof. And so some things that you would take you, you know, half an hour to sort of check on your own. Okay. So I'm mentioning this. So you've got that business. Okay, well now Y is a union of, of, uh, of sets, okay, and uh, the clo uh, of, of closed sets now, okay? So, so not all of these can be rare, right? Not all of these sets are rare, so um, by category, th because Y is com uh, complete, By the category theorem, um, so for some k, not uh, some k, then k times this T B one bar, okay, contains an open ball. All right, so we're almost done with step one, okay? Because I had to say that TB1 bar contains an open ball. Now I have that the dilation of TB1 bar contains an open ball. But now what I do is I basically shrink it down again. <laughs> um, how do I know that if, that if uh, K times TB1 bar contains an open ball, then, TB, then TB1 bar itself contains an open ball? Would that make sense? Uh, one way to do it is to uh, translate everything to the origin. I think one way to do that, it takes a little bit of playing around. Okay, this contains an open ball. So what what do I call that? I'll call that B uh, Z delta or something like that. Okay. Now how am I going to get the TB1 bar itself contains an open ball? I think maybe the easiest way to do it is say. Here's TB1 bar. Okay, and here's this ball. I'm sorry, this is K times TB1 bar. And that contains some ball here, B, Z, delta. Then what I can do is uh, just I just need to show that TB1 bar contains an open ball. So how will I do that? If I shrink everything down, what will... Uh, uh, maybe I can just shrink Z too, right? Um, what do you think is the easiest way to do it? I think maybe the easiest way to do it is to first translate the ball to the origin, then shrink it down, and then move it back. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so if I take the T K T B one bar minus Z. The author is going to skip this part too. Okay, this minus z contains um, b zero delta. Okay, now shrink the whole thing down. Okay, so that means that uh, now just divide this whole set by k, and then it's going to contain b zero delta over k. So that means that t b one bar minus z over k contains this is, this is just translating the whole set by moving it by this vector, z over k. This contains b0 delta over k. Okay. And now put the z, z over k in there. And so therefore, tb1 bar contains bz over k delta over k. So what you kind of expect, but anyway, you can do it with a little computation, okay? Call it B0 delta, then I'm going over here and doing this on the bottom of the board. So by a little playing around, 
just translating and dilating things, you, you get it. Okay? Using the fact that the dilate of a ball centered at the origin is itself a ball. Okay. So we have the lemma. Now, how does that finish the job? Now I want to prove the open mapping there. <laughs> okay. We have the lemma. So what can we do now? Okay. So we have this step, step B. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Did I did not finish it. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't finish the lemma. I needed B0 to contain this B. I needed to open the, excuse me, the image of B0 itself contains B0 epsilon. So I haven't finished the lemma yet. I've got the step one. Okay, TB1 bar contains this. Now what I'm going to do is <laughs> I'm going to um, go to TB0 bar. Okay. And so that's going to be a, uh, a bigger set. Okay. Okay, and um, I need to show that, actually I need a TB0 without the bar, and I need to show now that there's this other open ball sitting inside it. Okay, B0 epsilon. I draw a better picture in the, in the notes, I think. Okay, so I still need to show that this one is centered at the origin. I've got this one that's away from the origin. So how am I going to get it back to the origin now? Okay, so step B. the dean's office for an eraser. They don't have one either. They gave me this crappy one. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, it's better than nothing. Anyway. Um, so how do I do step B? B? I call it the step B1. Try to make this intelligible. Okay. Um, So show that B star minus Y, so I have this B star, which is the B Y naught epsilon, B star equals, uh, B star minus Y naught equals B zero epsilon, okay, which I'm going to call that, uh, I'm going to call it also something else, V zero, okay, V zero, because it's in Y. All right, so I'll use, call that V. V zero epsilon, this is a subset of Y, okay? Which is in the closure of TB1 bar minus Y naught, okay? Um, I want to show that that is in TB0 bar. Now, is that what I wanted? Okay. Sure. Seems like I have the difference between the bar and the not bar here. Maybe the lemma was just to put the bar on there. Let me see. Lemma. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's one last thing to do. Okay. This step B and then the step C. Okay, first you're going to get this. Do this by showing simply that the closure. Uh, I'm sorry, do what? Uh, show that this is a subset of TB0 
Okay, I'm sure. Which is already already here. This is already. What I need to show is that show that with this definition. <coughs> that indeed uh, V0, in fact, is a subset of TV0 bar. In other words, take the image of the ball with radius 1 and then close it. I want to show that V0 is in there. Okay? Do this by showing um, that uh, indeed that if I translate TB1 bar by why not, then that's still in TB0 bar. Okay, so I already have V0 in here. I want to show that this one is in, in TB0 bar, and therefore I'll have V0 in TB0 bar. Okay, so I'm taking this B star and translating it to the origin. I want to show that indeed it's in the, uh, the image of, of the ball with twice the radius as B1. Okay, so I am putting the bar here. I'm sorry, I want this, this ball, B0 epsilon, to be there. And then I want to show that it's actually in the thing that's not the closure. Okay? <laughs> so I'm doing it in steps. First get it in the closure, and then try to get it from there. So let's see how that's going to work. This looks kind of difficult to see what's going on. Okay? So how am I going to do this? Let step B1, let Y belong to TB1 bar minus Y naught. Okay, I'm just going to see if I can get it. Okay, to show that y belongs to TB0 bar, okay, then y plus y naught is the limit of TWN, n goes to infinity, infinity for some WN in B0 one half, right? B1. B1, because I'm saying that y plus y naught now is in, in the closure of TB1, and therefore it's some limit of elements WN, T of WN, where WN is in B1. Okay, then what does that give magically? Okay, and also I can write um, Y also. Is, um, well, why not itself, I'm sorry, why not itself is also uh, in TB1 bar. Okay, why not is already in TB1 bar. Okay. Why not was in TB1 bar. This is TB0 bar. I already did show step one so I can erase this. this is my TB1 and TB0 are interacting here. <laughs> TB0 is the bigger one. Okay. I'm trying to show the lemma. TB0 bar is here. This Y0 is in TB1 bar. Okay. The Y plus Y0 is also in TB1 bar by definition. Okay. So Y0 itself is also a limit n goes to infinity. T of Zn, let's say, for some Zn in B1. Okay. So what does that give y to be equal to? So then y, by subtracting, equals y plus y naught minus y naught. I can write that as a limit of t of wn minus zn. n goes to infinity. Now, wn is in b1 and zn is in b1, then the difference is also in the ball. Okay. <laughs> if I have two things, okay. If I have two things in a ball, the difference... Um, it's still in the ball, right? Is that obvious? Um, well, let's see. I guess you have... I need to check that, that uh, if Zn here and Wn is in here, then Zn, I think it's by the reverse triangle inequality, Zn minus Wn is greater than or equal to the absolute value of Zn minus Wn. Okay, both of these are less than or equal to a half. Okay, if they're in the ball B1, and therefore the difference is less than or equal to a half. Or less than a half. Both, both of these are less than a half. 
Okay, if you take a number between zero and a half and a number between zero and a half and subtract, I get a number between zero and a half most, which is uh, okay. So this is uh, did I did I do it wrong? I need to go the other way. That's not good. Uh, that's bigger. That's not good. Um, how did I show that Zn minus Wn is in B1 half? That seems obvious. Okay, I'm getting confused. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not going to use 1 half. It doesn't necessarily have to be 1 half because it could be on opposite sides of the diameter. So it's in B0. This is in B0. Obviously, they do have this. Zn, <laughs> I'm just going to use the triangle inequality. Zn minus Wn less than or equal to Zn plus Wn which is less than a half plus a half equals one. I only have to get it in the larger ball. Okay, so this is in, um, this is equal to where Wn minus Zn is in B0. Okay, actually the limit does hold. You're assuming therefore Y is in the TB0 bar. Okay. These two imply that Wn minus Zn is in B0. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, that's a little bit sketchy. The difference with these two points, Z and W, and I'm trying to check all the details rather than just run through the schematic. I'm sure it's been checked by a billion other people. Okay. <laughs> so why not just run through the schematic? But let's check it ourselves. Zn minus Wn. Okay, it could be the length of diameter, so the distance could be one half. It could be one if the radius is one half for this ball. Okay. Okay, so you are, you did get this step B1. Step B2, so this has been checked. Uh, that indeed this is true. So this has been checked. Okay. What's the next step? Step B2. I need I put uh, I already decided what BN was going to be. Recall the BN is equal to the ball of center to zero and radius two to the minus n. Okay, and then we have um, we have that um, T of BN. We already went through this argument. Is two to the minus n um, T B one? Okay or B0 actually, the way we've got it set here, okay? And what you have is that the closures also correspond, and I can put the closure just over the P0 part, okay? TBN is this, okay? Now I'm gonna put this, hence what do I have? I have that um, if I take VN to be equal to the ball of radius zero and um, Radi excuse me, ball of radius, excuse me, center zero and radius two to the minus epsilon in y, right? What I said was if v0 was just the b0 epsilon that sits in y, then uh, I had v0 in tb0 bar, okay? So now if I scale the whole thing down, let's put it this way, b0 epsilon. I'm done with the y naught now, okay? I've got this. B0 epsilon, this is in TB0. Now I'm going to define Vn by scaling this ball down. Okay, then it's going to be in the corresponding scaled down version of this. And so I automatically get that Vn is a subset of uh, TBN bar. Okay. Where this is, Vn is the ball of radius. 2 to the minus n in x. Okay, so by step 1 I have that. All right, that's all I'm going to do in step b2. That's all I'm going to say. I'm just going to scale it. Okay, I've got to go step 1 and 2 together, just one step b. Okay, so I've got this with this. Okay. So I've got all these boxes together. Now the step C is to use the Cauchy sequence. Show 
that V1. Now I'm going to take just a smaller one, just a slightly smaller one. I've already said, I already said that V0 is in TB0 bar. I'll take this and divide the radius by 2 and say then I can take the closure sign off. Okay? Somehow, in other words, this closure does not eat up. There's not somehow, putting the closure on does not like fill out, you know, a huge ball somehow. It's not that th it's not like a thick layer you can put over everything by closing it. It's only a thin layer, okay? That's what's going on. And so if I take the radius by dividing it by two, then I'll just get inside the uh, not closed thing, okay? So we have to prove that, you know, abstractly by using our Cauchy sequences and so on. We don't know what the geometry of the space looks like per se. So let's look. Step C, show V1 is a subset of TB0. Okay, so now, I'm gonna, as I said, I'm just going to go ahead and take the radius epsilon divided by 2. Okay, that's what I want to show. So I'll, let's do that. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Let Y be in V1 equals B0 epsilon over 2. We have that Y is also a subset of the closure of TB1 bar by step B2. That's just what I said over here. V1 is in the closure of TB1. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Therefore, if it's in the closure of something, there's something nearby that's in db1 itself. Therefore, there exists a v in tx1, v equals t tx1, I'm sorry, belonging to tb1. So now x1 belongs to b1, x1 belongs to b1, and, and how close am I? Such that y minus v equals y minus tx1, okay, is less than whatever I like, okay? Any positive number, and I'm going to take, we're going to start constructing the elements of a geometric series, and we're going to say less than epsilon over 4 here. <laughs> I know this is going to look bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I basically I want to get inside this open ball. I'm going to say, well, I can get inside, you know, if I give up a little here. Um, If I start inside a smaller ball, then I'll stay pretty much inside that smaller ball, except for epsilon. I'll slop out a little bit, so now I'm three quarters epsilon from the origin. You see, I started at a point which is epsilon over two from the origin, okay? And maybe it's not in TB1, but uh, at least. Uh, uh, there's a point in TB1 that's not very far now from the origin. It's only three, TX1. I mean, X1 is only, um, TX1 is only three epsilon over four from the origin, right? Because V is less than or equal to Y minus V plus, let's see, is that right? What am I thinking? Let's just draw the picture. So make sure we've got this right. I thought I had it right here just a second ago. Okay. <laughs> so what I have is that I've got TB1 here. Bar. Back to this picture that I had. Okay, the origin is here. And I know that if I take a small enough ball, center at the origin, then I'm actually inside here. Okay. Um, and I want to show that, in fact, here's TB0 without the closure sign. I want to show that, that uh, this TB0 contains a B0 epsilon. Okay. So here's a B0 epsilon over 2. I start here. I take Y in there. Okay, take a Y in there. 
okay, then what what will happen is that okay y y is still in TB1 bar, so there's there's somebody in TB1, okay, who's close to that, as close to that as I like, okay. Because y is in the TB, see maybe maybe y is on the boundary of TB1, okay. So, but there's somebody approximating y as close as I like that's still in TB1, okay. So here's my x, excuse me, here's my TX1, and that's as close as I like to y, okay. Maybe we should make it even closer. Okay, here's TX1. <laughs> okay, close to Y. All right. Then how far is TX1 from the origin? Well, Y was at most epsilon over 2. TX1 is at most epsilon over 4. So TX1 is at most epsilon, 3 epsilon over 4 from the origin. Okay. So what I'm going to try to do is then I'm going to take another element. Okay and so on. Let's just see what I'm going to do next. Let's go to the next step and you'll see what's going on. Okay, so what am I going to do next? T minus, Y minus TX1 itself now is small. Y minus TX1 is normal less than epsilon over 4. Okay, so Y minus TX1 is in V2. Okay, there's an element of V2. The difference is an element of V2. Okay, so even though V2 is, is a small ball here, this difference is inside the smaller ball. Okay, so I'm translating back to the origin again in some sense. So Y minus TX1 is in V2. So therefore, which is itself a subset of TB2 bar, because that's what the statement B2 is over here. All right, therefore, there's an element x2 in b2 without, okay, so that tx2 uh, is close to this element, so that y minus tx1, which is a small thing now, it can also be approximated by something even small, uh, so something else in b2. So this is even, is, is small, okay, less than epsilon over Eight. Okay. So I'm taking this thing. This is itself in some small ball at the origin. This difference y minus t x one, and I'm saying okay, that's in a small ball. This for it's inside the dilate of this db one bar. Anyway, I can stay away from the bar. So uh, I get my x two in the b two. So I get this. So, so TX2 is really in TB2 without the bar. All right, that's the point. So that I'm, I have a little room, I have this epsilon over 8. Okay. Now I'll keep repeating the argument. Okay? And so what you'll get is you get Y minus TX1 plus and so on plus TXN less than epsilon over 2 to the N plus 1. Okay? And where uh, x1, uh, x2, and so on, these are x, x, xn is in uh, uh, bn. Okay? And so what you're actually getting is that obviously, therefore, that um, y is the limit. y is the limit of tx1 plus and so on plus txn. y equals. T of x1 plus and so on plus xn limit n goes to infinity. Okay. Okay. With uh, xj, the norm of xj itself is less than, or norm of, yeah, norm of xj is less than uh, bn, so the norm of xj is less than. Uh, less than 2 to the minus j. All right, stri you're strictly inside the ball of radius 2 to the minus j. Okay, so that means that the partial sums, x1 plus xn, 
That's a Cauchy sequence. Okay? Because xj is less than equal to 2 to the minus j. We've been through that argument before. I won't repeat that. Okay, so this, this partial sum is a partial sum of a, uh, it gives you a Cauchy sequence. Therefore, this x1 plus xn does converge to x. All right? Therefore, y equals tx for x equals the limit x1 plus and so on plus xn n goes to infinity. All right? The question is, where's x? Well, x, it turns out, is in B0. And here's the argument that uh, we could have used last, when we proved uh, the uniform, let's see, what was, what was it? The bare category theorem, remember that, where we worried about 2 versus 3. And he, he showed you the, the little trick to make sure you can get it away with this epsilon over 2 to the n instead of epsilon over 3 to the n here. <laughs> okay, what's the little trick? If you say x, the norm of x, is less than or equal to the norm of x1, you isolate that by itself first, which itself is less than epsilon uh, over 2, okay, because x1 was in b1. Okay, I'm sorry, f, excuse me, 1 over 2. Okay, so this plus the remaining series. K goes from 2 to infinity. So you just, <laughs> if you get the strict less than, you do this trick. This is what I could have done before, if you remember what I was doing. This is less than a half, because x1 was in the ball of radius 1 half. The, B sub one, the b's have, uh, the, the radii does not involve the epsilon, OK? You know, it's plus the summation, then 2 to the minus j. j goes from 2 to infinity equals 1 half plus 1 half equals 1. So I guess strict, that x has norm strictly less than 1. So I'm using the, the completeness of, of x space here, that x was a Banach space. So this Cauchy, the Cauchy sequence x1 plus so on plus xn converged. I already used the completeness of the y space because I applied the fair category theorem. OK. I'm not using completeness of y per se here. I'm just using the fact that y is a limit here. And that the x1 plus and so on and v plus xn does go to x, so the y equals t of x. OK. Uh, I am using the continuity of t there as well, I guess. I'm pulling the limit across. I'm saying as long as I can pull this limit across as long as this limit exists. OK? OK. So that gives you the proof of the lemma. The lemma is proved. Therefore, V0, what did I have? I had, uh, sorry, so the V1 is therefore in TB0. OK, because every element in V1 was a T of an X for some X in V1. OK, therefore, and Y equals T of X. OK, X is in V1 and Y equals TX. So for every Y, I have this fact. Therefore, all of V1 is in TB0. This is a ball of radius epsilon over 2. So I have to change the epsilon to epsilon over 2 in the statement of the lemma. OK? <laughs> OK. So all that, just to get this. Now, how do you finish the proof of the open mapping theorem? OK, I think I left that part out of the notes. <laughs> There's a paragraph that tells you how to finish. OK, and um, so I have to look at that for a second. Finally, OK, now that we have the lemma, lemma is proved. Finally, let A be a subset of x be open in x. We need to show and then let y equal t of x be in t be in uh, the image, okay? For some x and a. For some x and a. I need to show that uh, there's a ball around y that stays in T of A. And that's going to be just by translating around and using this lemma here. Okay. We must show proof of the open mapping theorem. Proof of open mapping. Proof of 
4.12-2. Well, this pen is not that dark. We must show... Uh, there exists a ball about y that remains in T of A. That's how we show it. the set is open. Every point in the set must be surrounded by a ball that remains in the set. Okay, what we do have is that A is open, so it contains BXR. We know this. A is open, so contains a ball BXR. Okay, some R positive. Okay. Therefore, by the same idea, if I take a minus x and divide by r, therefore a minus x, just subtract, translate a by x, and then divide by r, okay, and dilate it toward the origin, contains b, 0, 1, okay. I subtract x to give me back to the origin. I divide by r to give me a, a unit radius. So dividing by r, if r is small, means multiplying by a big number. Okay? <laughs> Say so multiply by a big number. Okay? But then I can undo it later. Okay? So now t of 1 over r, a minus x. Uh, contains b0 epsilon by the lemma. Alright, I take t of the set, t contains this, so I apply t to that thing, it'll live for contain t of b01, but t of b01 contains b0 epsilon. Okay, so now I can just multiply it out again. So t, so now just take the uh, multiply by r and add x. So t of A contains uh, multiply by R and add X, so that gives me B X R epsilon. Okay? Where R is a small number. Um, did I forget to uh, oh T I'm sorry, T T X here, because when I apply T to the X, I get a T X. Okay? So let's put the T X in here. So that's what I needed to show. QED. So we're done with the theorem. We're also done with the extra part of the theorem which that I mentioned before. And I don't have time to go through now and actually verify it using this <laughs> than other than what I already did. So that's the open mapping theorem. Proof, finally. Um, then we have one more theorem, and that's the closed graph theorem. Um, let's have a look. Any comments or questions about this? We're going to use some of this stuff. The last part of the notes, let's see. I think the last page of these notes, um, I'm going to use the closed graph theorem quite a bit to get into the spectral theory. Okay. Where I use the open mapping theorem, I think it's going to be in the next set of notes. Um, so this, the usefulness of the open mapping theorem is not going to be clear until another week or so. I don't think I use it here. Um, let's see, where do I use it? You're not going to see the application until the very end. What we're going to want to do is when we start talking about the resolvent, we're going to start talking about, we're not talking, or maybe I did, did talk about the resolvent here. Yes, I did. Um, Thank you.
Trying to figure out where this open mapping term sneaks in in here. Okay. Well, <laughs> excuse me for a moment. Okay. All right. Well, I don't see it right this moment, so. Um, you'll, you do have an exercise, I think. What's the exercise? The exercise in 412. This is a better thing to look at. 412. You have discussion of equivalent norms. Yeah. There's not a whole lot going there either in terms of obvious application of open mapping terms. So here, it's just sort of not obvious what the application is, except to get that the inverse is bounded. That's what you want, and that's what we're going to use. Uh, it's going to be a point where we're going to do that. When we go to Chapter 7. When we go to Chapter 7, we're going to use the open mapping theorem. Let's see. There it is, I believe. Where is the dang open mapping theorem? Well, I guess I'm going to close it here because I don't know exactly where we're going to open it again. <laughs> so I think I'm going to close it here. Okay. But anyway, so I'm leaving it up in the air exactly where we do this. I do. I know that we use it because I know in the next set of notes I use the open mapping theorem. I just can't remember where. So uh, I'll give you the next set of notes when we get back. So you have homework due on four, uh, what? Four, se seven, eight, and nine, or is it due on Tuesday? Yeah. Four, seven, eight, and nine? Yeah, yes. Yeah, it's the uniform bondedness theorem. You still have the homework due on. Yeah. That's what we just turned in. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay, you just turned in the uniform bondedness theorem. So, you, okay. so it's another week, and another week before you get this stuff on the open mapping theorem and the closed graph theorem. Yeah. So the next one's like 411, 412. 411, 412, 430. I gave you one problem on numerical integration, just sort of looking at what the heck the problem is. Okay. If that turns out to be just too too nasty or something, we'll, we'll consider it extra credit uh, because I didn't spend hardly any time on 411. But I do want you to do the open mapping theorem and the closed graph theorem problems because we've been doing a lot with open and closed mm -hmm. things. Uh, that's all we've been doing, it seems like. <laughs> for the last several weeks, and we might as well just finish it up. Yeah. So now, actually, these theorems, with these terms, you can do just about everything you want. It's quite a nice structure. Um, you, if you start looking at the rest of the book, you just say, well, by this theorem, by this theorem, by this theorem. So. We've gotten most of the theory. Yeah, we have this one last thing to do, which is not as hard as open mapping theorem. Close graph theorem is a little easier. Easier to motivate. Okay, <laughs> we'll see you.